Okay, good morning. All right, I'm going to pray for us again uh, before we get started. I Just as we were worshiping, isn't worship so awesome? Like, I'm just like, we get to be in front of God, and just it's just amazing. I just freak out every time. But I feel like I just saw this, kind of as we were worshiping, I feel like I got this, this picture of the Lord just blowing on us and just put it, blowing his breath on us. And as he did, we were like little dry leaves, and we just got taken up by the wind. And I just feel like he was saying that, you know, what he's doing in our church is going to be taken further and reach even to the nations of the world. And so I believe that even though we're talking about freedom today and not nations, though I would love to talk about nations, um, I believe that what God does in us is going to have global impact. And so I'm just going to pray for us, and we can jump in. So yeah, Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in our church, in our city, Jesus. Father, we thank you that all good things come from you. They start with you. And so we just thank you that today that you've got a word for us, Jesus, that you want to do a new thing in us. And so I just ask, Holy Spirit, would you come put your presence on me as I share, Lord? I ask that your spirit would, uh, yeah, translate everything that comes out of my mouth so that it hits people right where they need it, Jesus. And just thank you, Lord. Without you, uh, there's no reason for any of this. And so we just invite your presence. Have your way, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So as Mr. Sean said, my name is Gabe. Um, my wife, Taylor, is here with me, second row. You probably know her. She's way cooler than me. And so if you can talk with one of us later, choose her. Um, but so I serve on our staff as the communications coordinator and the missions director. And man, I love our church so much. I've been a part of Antioch for about six and a half years. Um, and I just love being here. I love coming on Sundays. I love life group. I love everything that we are a part of. And I really do believe that God is going to change the world through our little church. And so I'm excited to be sharing today, talking a little bit about freedom, um, because I am really passionate about freedom. And even what I'm going to share with you is not something I just made up, but it's something that God came a few months ago and really did in me. I got this really deep revelation from the Lord. And so I'm excited to share with you because I hope that you'll be blessed like I was. And so, um, like I said, I've been at Antioch for about six years, started coming here at the beginning of college. Uh, I'd known God most of my life. My parents really loved Jesus, and I grew up in the church, but it was when I came to college that I really started to experience the fullness of God. And one of those things was experiencing freedom, because I knew about sin in the church, like people talk about sin a lot, but I hadn't really heard much about freedom, and I didn't know that you could actually get free of all the stuff that weighs you down. I thought we were just supposed to be these sad, mopey Christians. We're like, yeah, the enemy's at work again this week. I'm just having a hard time. I didn't realize we could be victorious. And so coming to Antioch and starting to be discipled and spend time with God, I began to be set free from all of my junk. And since then, man, I've just been so, so passionate about freedom. I love seeing people walk in freedom and get free from all of their bondage and just become who they're made to be. And so being someone who's passionate about freedom also means that I'm really just, I hate when I see people not walking in what God's called them to and not living the full life that he's made them for. So it's my desire today that as we go together into this message that we would all grow more in being free people and really knowing what that means. And so I believe today we are going to be looking at the key, what I believe is the key to walking in lasting freedom. Not just a moment, not just for a few months, but something that lasts throughout your whole life. Um, and so we are going to see that as the true freedom really happens when the power and presence of God is met with our willingness to go on a journey with him. And so I'm really excited. So before we get into some of the scripture I want to share today, I want to get a little crowd engagement from you guys. I like interaction. And so I just want to see a show of hands, a few questions I have. So I think I, would, I could guess this, but just by a show of hands, who enjoys, this is like something that you're passionate about or something that's fun, when people try to sell you things you don't want? Okay. Um, let's try another one. Uh, what about... Let's see, what about telemarketer calls? Who loves telemarketer calls? That's one, two, okay. This is better than I thought it was gonna be. Um, what about, even, even more annoying, what about when people show up at your door and like have like these steak knives you've never heard of and they're like, they're the best knives. And you're like, how would I know that? Everything about being sold something is really annoying. 
which is a bummer because I'm a graphic designer, and so I work in marketing, and I'm selling people things all the time. Uh, so I apologize for any ways that I may have created ads that you've seen because my job is to sell you things. But what's interesting is being in my profession, I, I've learned a lot and think a lot about advertising and communication and kind of these things and how they work. And it's crazy because the Lord really knows us and he knows our hearts. And so for me, a few months ago, I was thinking on these things and learning about these things and God just started to speak to me really powerfully. And so that is a little bit what I'm going to share today, the story that God brought me on. But so for a minute, I want to talk about Facebook. And I'm not going to be that pastor It's like, you need to get off Facebook, you're all in sin. I don't care that much. But God is going to show you, I believe, through this little analogy that he revealed to me, what freedom really looks like. And so I don't know if you know this, but every fourth post that you see on Facebook is an ad. Every fourth post. So that means that somebody paid for it and targeted you, probably specifically, to see it. And so if I uh, manufacture hunting bows, I can go on Facebook and say, hey, I want you to show this many ads to men between the ages of 30 and 60 who live in Baton Rouge and who are interested in hunting. And it will find those people and show you exactly what I want to show you. It's a little creepy. Um, And so it's interesting because marketing has really changed, right? For a while it was like all we had was TV commercials and things you get in the mail, but now it's like they really know what you want, and they can get right to what you're interested in, which is nice when you really want something, but it can be really annoying when you're being thrown all these things you don't actually want. And so what's interesting about Facebook is that it doesn't just make up these things. It really does know you. It knows the things that you've searched for, the things you're interested in, the pages that you like, the stuff you interact with, and it's keeping track so that whenever it needs to show you something, uh, it can make money is really the whole point. And so Facebook always gives us ads that we want to see. We've told it there's some reason that they think that we're interested in this. And so actually, thankfully, Facebook kind of gives us a little control in this. Most of us don't know this, but whenever you keep seeing the ad in your feed for like electric nose hair trimmers that are like the best of the best, like you can actually tell Facebook, I don't want to see this anymore. I don't care. And so I'm actually going to show you my Facebook ad settings. This is me. This is real. Um, So some interesting things here. I don't love the Lego movie, but Facebook is sure that I do. Um, And I can never afford Maseratis, Mercedes, or any of these other fancy cars on here. Uh, Go to the next one. This is funny. This is people it thinks I'm interested in. Most of them I agree with, except for Larry the Cable Guy. I have no idea what he's doing on there. But he's snuck in somehow. And then go to the next one. This one's great, except one of my top interests seems to be gambling. And uh, so I repent, do not tell Donnie or I will never preach again. Um, But point is, this is an example of what Facebook sees that it thinks that I care about. And I can actually go in here and I can can click off these things and be like, nah, I don't want them anymore, I'm not interested, Um, which is great. And so I was doing this a few months ago and clicking off some stuff, but after a while I realized I could actually click off everything. Like I could get rid of everything and then Facebook would never show me ads again. But sadly, that's not how it works. See, if I, even if I click off all these things I don't want to see, if I go back and I'm researching and Googling or still liking the stuff that I used to, it's just going to put the same things back there. Does that make sense? Like, it doesn't matter how many times I go through and clear it all out. If what I'm doing and the things that I care about and I'm interested in don't change, then the results actually don't change either. And so as I'm realizing this, I'm like, man, how do I beat the system? Like, do I just need to delete Facebook or I just hate It's weird that I hate being advertised to so much when it literally is my life. Um, But so God started to speak to me about this, and I began to realize that this is a lot how our flesh works and how our hearts work. And actually, if you're when you're scrolling through something on your phone, um, not only are they taking track of if you click on it or if you comment or if you click the link, but like they even know how long you're looking at it. And so even if you don't do anything with it, but you're just kind of looking at it for a minute, like they know, and they're gonna take that into account next time they show you something. And I was like, man, Lord, I think that is how my flesh works. Like, in my thought life, like, when I give myself to something, or even if I'm not walking in sin, but, man, if I'm lingering on something that's not from God, like, I'm telling my flesh, this is good, and I want some more of this, and I'm kind of beginning this cycle in my mind. And I was really convicted of this because I don't want to dwell on things that are not from God. But so as I was learning through this, I kind of realized that there are two pieces. It all kind of connected for me. There are two pieces that we need to to grab grab onto 
if we're to really be free in God. And I have seen both sides of this equation, but I believe that the perfect balance of freedom and what really allows us to walk in lasting freedom is when we match the power and presence of God with our willing participation to walk with him on a journey. And if we swing to one side or the other, we're going to miss it. And so see, the Holy Spirit and encountering his presence is like when I delete all my history on Facebook, right? Like everything is washed clean. It's a new slate. There's nothing there anymore. But the problem is, like I said, if I keep searching for the same things and if my life doesn't actually change, essentially it's going to go back to how it was. Or what I could do is if I'm talking about the participation side, how I can be involved, I could just get off Facebook for years. But the problem is the moment I step back in, all this stuff is still here. It's all right there and waiting for me. And so this reality began to hit me, and I began to understand situations I've seen with people that I've walked with. And like I said, I'm really passionate about freedom. And so when I'm discipling people or walking with them, I'm, that's like, we're always talking about it. Like, hey, man, how is your life? Are you experiencing the freedom of God? Like, it is what I burn for. And sadly, I've seen a lot of situations where people don't experience the fullness of what God's made them for. And so, like I said, there's two extremes. So there was a guy I knew who was really, really encountering the presence of God. I mean, he would come to college services, he'd come to church, and he would just weep. I mean, this was not a guy who cries. And he would just cry in the presence of God. He was really needing the Lord. But the problem was that outside of those moments, he hadn't learned that there's a practical component too, that there's something that we have to walk in and experience with God. And so because there was no discipline and no experience in the practicals, the hype and excitement of meeting with God didn't last very long because God had met with them and he had changed things and set them free, and it's true. But then a few weeks later, man, all those things I was already tempted in, they're not gone. They're still here. I'm still having to fight the same battles that I was, so what, what am I missing? And sadly, he kind of is not walking with God anymore and is really heartbreaking and then we have people on the other side, right? I know a guy who was just really fighting to walk in a holy identity and who God had called him to be. And man, he had done everything. Like he had people checking in on him. Hey man, how are you doing? How is this going? He was like going through every practical step he could. So for example, uh, if you're dealing with sexual sin, something that could be good practical steps is not watching shows that are really sexual or making sure that you're not just Instagram scrolling at 2 a.m. Like things aren't good that are gonna come from that. And so he had done all the practical things, and he was doing it great. But the problem was, in the spirit, he hadn't been meeting with God. And there was a dryness where he needed the life of God to come in and move. So after a while, he just got tired of doing all the same things and seeing nothing change. And he, too, kind of quit. And so for me, this breaks my heart because I know what people are made for. We're made to be free. And freedom is the sweetest gift from God. And so seeing this happen, my heart has just been burning, even for years, like, God, how can we help this not happen? How can people really get free and, and maintain freedom and walk in it and it be a lifestyle and not just a few months? And so that's where I feel like God is bringing us today, that it's only when we balance these two sides, when we meet in the middle, that real and lasting freedom will happen. And so we kind of see this in a verse that I want us to read. It's Romans 12, 1 through 2. And we can kind of read it together. So it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, pleasing, and perfect will. And so we're going to break the scripture part just a little bit, but there's three parts that we need to see here. And it kind of comes back to what I'm saying. Like, we have to figure out how this process of freedom works. Otherwise, this whole series we've been doing is great and exciting. But if you don't really leave knowing how to walk in freedom, then we've missed it. And so my goal is that this would give us the tools that we need to really see this happen. All right, and so the first part, verse 1 of Romans 12. We'll come back to this in a second. Leo, could you go to that verse 1? <laughs> That's all good. I'll just read it. Okay, so the beginning of this says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, to live in view of God's mercy. Offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So, Leo, you can go back to those blanks for a second. 
So if you want to kind of keep notes with me, I'm very linear, and so this blesses me a lot. So if you're taking notes, you can kind of write down these blanks. We're going to fill these in as we go. But so part one of this scripture is this calling, right? Paul is saying that our calling is to offer our whole lives to God as a sacrifice, as a way to worship him. And even during worship, I just found myself singing it, Lord, we are made to worship. It's why we were created. Just like that is what we're made for, is God has created us to be people that worship him. But the problem is a lot of times we think of worship as the spiritual things or the unseen things. Like I'm doing worship at church and my heart is coming alive. And, or, you know, like I'm at life group and people are praying for me and I'm just worshiping God. That is worship. But if we read this, it's a little more than that. It's how we live too. We can't, we can't separate the way that we live and what God is doing. And so Paul's saying your whole life needs to be worship. Not just a piece, not just a Sunday morning, but your whole life And so that means we're to be set apart, we're to be holy. And so even, you know, whatever it takes, whatever the small things are, we all have places where we can grow in freedom with God. We can become more holy. And the reality is you can't give God something that you don't have. And so if there are parts of your life that are still given to living like the world lives or looking like people who don't know Jesus, like we have got to fight that those things would be given over to God because he's worth our whole lives. I do not want to give half of my life to Jesus. I want to give the whole thing. And I think that you guys would agree as well because we are not a half-hearted people here. And so we can actually see this in the Bible too. There's examples. In Exodus 9.1, says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so they will worship me. And so there's a correlation between freedom and worship God was saying, let his people go so that they can worship me, because that's what I'm after. He was longing for their worship, but he needed them to be free in order to do it. And then also in Matthew 18, or 15, verse 8, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he quotes Isaiah, saying, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And so this is kind of a similar thing to where it's like their words were right, their worship looked good, but their lives were what was lacking. And so we see this part one, this calling that Paul is talking about, and the calling is to be people that worship God with our whole lives, that hold nothing back, that every moment, every breath is our praise to him, just the same as when we worship on Sundays. And so this is our part one, this is where we start. There's a calling from God, there's a commission that Paul is giving to the church, and that it's for us too. All right, and so I'm actually going to skip over the second part. We're going to come back to it in a minute, I'm going to show you why. But part three is the promise. And so there's this calling, right? We're called to be this thing. God has made us for this, and there's a promise. So the promise says in verse 12, the, first, the second part of verse 2, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And so Paul is saying that as we're transformed, we'll know the will of God. And so to recap, the calling is that you would live a life full of worship in every way. And the promise is that when you do, you'll know the will of God. And the will of God is something that you probably hear a lot in church, but what it really means is to know what God's up to, to know what he's doing. And for us to be an apostolic, kingdom-building, world-changing church, we have to know God's will. And I even think about if if you're a college student, if you're in class, and there's that person that always sits next to you, man, they're probably dealing with something that needs a touch from God. Or if you're a mom and you go to your kid's soccer practice, there's probably the other mom, and you know that there's some marital stuff, some tension going on. And for us to be in the situations in our lives, we have to see like God sees. We have to know his will and say, God is willing to move on the behalf of this student and set them free from their depression. That God wants to touch this marriage and redeem them. And so for us to be who we're made to be, we have got to know God's will. We've got to see what he's about. We've got to see where he's moving and what he's doing. And we can't miss it. And really, to be an apostolic church means that we're one that goes into the dark places and we bring light. We're one that sees the injustice in our city and the brokenness and we do not stand by. We bring justice. We bring reconciliation. That we're at the forefront of what God's doing. And I know that's who we're made to be, but I also know that if we don't get free, we'll never know the will of God. We won't know what he's up to and we won't be able to do it. And so it's my desire that as we get free, we will be set free to set others free. All right, so I'm going to go back to part two here. So part one is our calling. Part two, or part three is the promise. But in between, there is a bridge 
that combines and, and connects the calling to the promise, and that is the process. And see, the problem is, a lot of times in the church, we know the calling and we know the promise. We hear that a lot. God's called us to be a church for the whole city. We know that we're going to see nations reach. We have a lot of vision on both sides, but we're missing something in between. And I have seen way too often people who are called to great things and have a promise from God, but in the middle, they get lost. And so I want us to really hone in on this. And you can see it in uh, Romans 12, this, the first part of verse 2. So it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so Paul is saying, live a life full of worship. And when you do, you'll know God's will. But here is how it happens. Be transformed as your mind is renewed. And so for us to hone in on this, it means, like I was saying earlier, that true freedom happens when the power and presence of God is paired with our willingness to go on a journey with him. And even if you think back to that Facebook analogy, right, like I was saying, one side isn't enough. Just doing one thing isn't enough. I can't just delete my history, you know, and, and move on because if my life doesn't change, then the result's not going to change either. And the other side, too, that if I shut everything off, it doesn't matter because when I come back, it's still waiting for me. And so for us to be a people of the process, we have to embrace both sides of that equation. And so we know that our calling and God's promise must be good for us. And so if we do the process right, we will see it happen because God's faithful. And so in this verse, it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what's cool about that is that this is really from the Holy Spirit. And we're learning a lot, actually, in science today and over the last 10, 15 years about how your brain works. And Paul didn't know this, but the Holy Spirit did. And so the fact that he's saying renew your mind is actually making more sense than ever. You can see scientists are figuring out as they study the brain that your brain actually forms pathways. And pathways are kind of like a set of steps. And so going back to the analogy of someone who maybe is dealing with sexual sin, their pathway could look like this. I'm at home and I'm alone and I'm feeling a little bit insecure and like I'm not worth anything. So, you know, I'm just going to scroll through Instagram for a little while and, you know, maybe see if there's cute girls on here or something that will make me feel a little more connected and a little more enough. And before long, it keeps end up sliding into things like pornography and sexual sin. But you see there's a starting point and then it moves through this pathway. And the problem is that growing up, we start actually building these pathways in our minds and they're like a well-worn path. It's easier and easier to go on them every time we do. And so for that guy who's dealing with sexual sin, when he's feeling insecure or he's feeling that, that, that emotion again, it is like autopilot to go right to that old stuff. And so the problem is that old bad pathways are all in our hearts. I mean, we grew up outside of Jesus. Most of us didn't know God until at least a certain age. And for most of our lives, we've been building pathways that suck and that need to change. And the issue is they don't really go away, but the good news is, is that we can make new ones. And that by the power of the Holy Spirit and by our willingness to walk with him through the process, it can change. And so for me, what this has looked like in my story is, man, I came into college dealing with so much sexual sin and brokenness, and I needed Jesus. And so for me, growing up, my pathways, similar to that story, is that when I'm feeling insecure or less than or lonely, I would just go right to sexual sin. It was a natural thing for me. It didn't take me saying, I'm going to fall into sin tonight. No, I mean, it was normal. Like, it took no energy at all to slide right into it. But I started to renew my mind. God started to do a new thing. And so even, even earlier this week, I just woke up, and I was like, man, I'm, this is going to be a tempting day. I just felt it. Like, it's going to be a day i got to fight. But my pathways now, man, I start texting people, hey, bro, today is rough. I'm just feeling it. I need you to pray for me. I need you to be believing for God to move. And then what I started doing, I started declaring truth over myself. I started asking God to speak in. But these things didn't happen overnight. I didn't change the way that I think and the way that I respond to temptation in a moment. It took time. Does that make sense? And so for us, we're in a culture that worships immediacy. I mean, if I want new socks, I can order them right now on Amazon, and I will be wearing them on Tuesday. Like, we can get things as fast as we want. And it's great, and it's convenient, but it teaches us something that does not align with the Bible. If you look in Exodus, when God set the Israelites free from Egypt, they wandered through the promise, or to the promised land for 40 years. They were in this wilderness, in this desert, and people have gone back and studied the path they took. And actually, if they would have taken it straight there, 
It would have taken 11 days. But 40 years were taken in a process. And it's not because God's mean or he's pulling a trick on people, but it's because actually Israel needed to learn how to be God's people again. And the same is true of us. And so we can have this moment where it's like, God heals me in a moment, everything's changed. But really, we need to learn how to know Jesus. And we need to learn how to walk with him. And often, it's in the process that we actually experience him. And so the problem is that we think that the calling and the promise is all that there is. And when it gets to the process, even like the stories of those guys I was sharing, when it starts getting hard and we don't know what's next, we, we just give up. But I'm saying that as a people, as a church, we have to be committed to the process. Because when we are, the world is going to be changed. We are going to get free. And even like the promise says, we'll know the will of God. God will move in our city. People will get set free and healed and restored. And it's going to be amazing. But I would just invite us and say, hey, we need to step into the process. And so even if we go back, Leo, to those little notes, if you're taking notes, the two parts of our process, like I mentioned, are needing the power and presence of God with our practical willingness to walk it out. And so just what that practically looks like is tending our heart, is meeting with God, is letting him speak to us. And we're, I, Mr. Sean mentioned earlier, we're part of a ministry called Connection Prayer that's in our church. And I would love for each of you to sign up to receive Connection Prayer because it is life-changing. And really what it is, is we just sit together and help kickstart your journey of getting your mind renewed, of beginning to walk in freedom and actually do it. And not just talk about it and say, yeah, we're going to be free, but really, really to live it out. And so to renew your mind, it means that I'm saying, Lord, what, what is happening to me? Why am, I, why am I wanting to fall into sin? Why am I wanting to be pulled towards something that doesn't bring me life? And it's letting God come in and say, hey, you're actually still dealing with some pain from when you were a kid, and I'm here to set you free. I'm here to make a new pathway so things can actually change, so we can really start to be free. And so, man, I am really excited because I do believe that God is doing a new thing in us, that no longer are we going to be people that, that cop out in the middle of the process, but that we're going to be people that say, yes, God, I'm in it for the process, and I don't care how long it takes. Because for me, coming out of the sexual sin of my brokenness, it took time. It took a lot of time. I would say, honestly, about three or four years of me really pressing into God and really praying and believing for breakthrough before I really saw what I was believing for. And he's still doing it. But the thing is, if we get so obsessed with getting to the end, we miss all that God wants to do in the process and how he wants to meet us, how he wants to show us his love. And so it's my hope, and it's what I'm going to call us to today, is that we would wholeheartedly embrace the process. And we wouldn't be people who miss it, who quit halfway through. We'd be people that go the whole way, that walk through the whole thing with God so that we can be free, so that the world can be changed, so that our city will be restored. And I know that God is faithful. And as we step into this place with him, he is going to do it. And so just to recap, we are called to worship Jesus with everything that we have. Not with just our Sundays, not with life group night, but with our whole lives. Every part is meant to be an offering to him. But to do so, we have to become a people of the process. We have to embrace the power of God that we need to meet us and empower us along with our willingness to go in a process, to say, God, I'm ready to take practical steps. I'm ready to learn how to be free. And when we do, the promise will be fulfilled. We will know the will of God, and the world will be better for it. Really, our city will be changed. The things that are broken, that need life, we are going to be the people that can do it and that can change things that no one else can because we carry the power of God. And so I'm just going to kind of close this out here, and um, I'm going to make this really practical for us. And so for me, some of the things that I do whenever I'm feeling tempted is I begin to uh, declare truth over me because my mind is so easily swayed. It's easy for me to start going down those old pathways. Even years later, it is not going to take much. And so for me, I need, to, I need to have some places, some practical steps to remember what freedom is like and remember who I'm made to be. So even, like I said, this Friday I woke up and I was just feeling rough. I was like, man, today is going to be a fighting day. But I remembered this thing that God had had me write down a few months ago. And so I started looking at these notes that he had given me. And so I'm going to read this over us. And you guys can go ahead and stand up. And I'm going to read this over us. And this is the truth that, man, when I started reading this, I came alive. I was like, yes, God. 
Lord, I remember who I'm made to be. I remember that I'm made to change the world, that I'm made for freedom. And I pray today that you would remember it too, that you would see it who you are. And so it says, Lord, I will choose to keep on fighting. I refuse to give up and give in to sin. I will continue to fight for my marriage and for holiness. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. And I declare that there will be a time of harvesting and it will be worth it. Jesus will not let me down. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I declare that the way I keep from becoming weary is to renew my mind. Tending my heart is the key. I must choose to take my thoughts captive and invite the Lord to speak into my mess. And man, as I just read this this week, I came alive. I mean, it just changed something within me. But see, it wasn't just the practicals. It wasn't just what I was reading. It was also the presence of God. He came and met with me. And we need both. We have to have both sides of the coin or we will never be a free people. And you guys, we have to be a free people. We have to be. We can't just be a church that just does the Sunday thing and comes in and out. We have to change the world. The nations of the earth are crying out to know God. Our city is broken and needs life. We cannot sit on the sidelines anymore and think it's okay to do this half-in thing. We've got to go all in. We've got to be in for the process. And when we do, God is going to show up like never before. Amen? All right, well, I'm just going to pray for us. Before I do, I invite my prayer teams to come on up. And there are a few people that I would like to address that I think God's going to minister to today. So some of you maybe have never experienced freedom for the first time. You were like me coming into college. You didn't realize that God really could set you free. That he could do something new in you. and That your sin could be your past and not your present. And if that's you and you want to experience freedom for the first time, I'd invite you to come on down and receive prayer. We're going to pray for you and believe for God to move in you. And the others are people who have experienced freedom, who've been in church, who've done the thing, but maybe you're feeling a little weary because all you've done is the practicals and you're missing out on the presence of God. Or maybe you've experienced his presence, but you really just don't know how to live it out. You don't know how to walk day in and day out in freedom. And so, man, if that's you, we're going to pray for you too. And if you need his presence, we're going to pray and believe he's going to touch you. And if you need some practicals, we're going to speak some truth. We're going to invite God to give you some good steps to walk it out. Because it is, it is my desire and the burning in my heart that, man, we would not miss the process. We would not miss out on the promise of what God's called us to do. But we would embrace this middle part, this part where we meet Jesus, where we come alive. So I'm just going to pray for us. Something I pray often is, Lord, set the church free to set the world free. For the world will never be free unless the church is first. So in Jesus' name, would you set our church free, Lord? Not just on the surface, Lord, not just a little bit, not just halfway, but free. Jesus, fully free. And will we no longer be people who live just this, this sad life where we can't get the full thing, we can't experience what you've made us for, but God, would we be people who walk through the process, who experience your power and the practicals, Lord, that our lives would be changed, that we'd shake off that old stuff, that we'd come alive, And Lord, that the world would know who you are. Lord, the world is looking for a church that looks free, that looks like you. And in Jesus' name, I say Antioch Church will be that church. Lord, that we will go into the dark places and bring light. So in Jesus' name, would you bless our church? Would you move in Jesus' name? Amen. And if that's you, don't wait and don't hesitate. Come on down and we'd love to pray for you.